This evening we read from the first letter of Paul to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy 6. Our text is found in the first two verses of this chapter. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters let them not despise them, because they are brethren, but rather do them service, because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, evil surmisings are evil suspicions, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich, that is, are eager to be rich, fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, Flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly, all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. O oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. May God bless the word. We look at verses 1 and 2 in particular. 1 and 2 of 1 Timothy 6. 
Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. Last week, we looked at a part of Ephesians chapter 6, what servants were called to do. Remember that Timothy is serving as the minister of the church at Ephesus when Paul writes these two letters to him. So it's as if Paul is sending three letters to Ephesus. This one is in the passage that we consider an addition to the thoughts that were expressed last week. Same concept, same ideas, but from a different perspective and therefore very profitable to consider. The Thursday morning study that we have with Among the Men is going through the book of Ephesus and right now we're in the middle of chapter 4 and we found that Paul's emphasis, and, and I bring this up because this is what the text is dealing with too, Paul's emphasis after chapters 1, 2, and 3 is that you're coming to the knowledge of these wonderful, fantastically wonderful truths of God's sovereign particular grace that that even brings Gentiles into union with Jews, that that precious truth requires a lifestyle. And we may not think, well, we preach the doctrine. We talk about just the truth. God didn't have the apostles write their letters that way. And our text is a powerful way of showing this. You can spout all the doctrine you want. And you can profess religious and strict love and adherence to it. But how you live can either cause all that truth to be blasphemed or honored. God doesn't give truth just to fill our heads. God gives truth to be lived. And the unique perspective of our text is that when that truth isn't lived in our day-to-day -day life, Monday through Saturday, then what we profess on Sunday is blasphemed. So may God bless us as we look at this, and may you children whose work is at school or in college, as we go out to our employments, whatever that may be, that we may seek to honor the name and the truth that we profess on the first day of the week.
We saw that work is something that God created man to do even before there was sin. We saw the effect of sin upon work was that man still had a work, but now it was going to be in the sweat of his face. We saw that God tells us there are six days that thou shalt labor in the fourth commandment. It's not a choice. It's a command of God. We saw that he requires the manner in which we work perform our labor at school again or in the workplace at a desk or out with physical labor is to be with diligence with diligence and faithfulness last week we saw that from Ephesians 6 that man who is a Christian is to look at the master that God has given to him as one to whom he must render obedience. We want to follow that up. Look at it now, same subject, our relationship to our employer from the perspective of this passage of the Word of God. Once again, notice that the gospel comes to those of any and every class of society. He just told in this same letter in chapter 2 that they had to pray for kings and for all that are in authority over them, that they might be saved. Now he looks at those who are literally slaves. These are people who either were born into slavery or because they couldn't maintain something, their job or their employment had to sell themselves into slavery, or they were captives that were captured from a foreign land and brought to serve in the homes or in the properties of their masters, of the, those who pillaged their own homes and brought them as captives here. To them, the gospel has come as well. And now notice. Notice how he identifies them as Christians. He doesn't say, like he does of their masters, that they're believing. He says there's believing masters, there's unbelieving masters. But he says to them, to these Christians who are slaves... He identifies them this way. You are under the yoke. You are under the yoke. That's what it means to be a Christian. You are freed from the bondage of Satan. You are delivered from the bondage of sin, namely, of having to sin all the time and not being able to do anything but sin. We're freed from that. But that doesn't make one free to do whatever they want. Freedom from the slavery of sin puts us under the yoke of the one who saved us. He who saved us from sin and its consequences and all of its punishments, he now becomes our Lord, Savior and Lord. And as our Lord, he becomes our master. And he gives us a yoke. And now remember the familiar words of Jesus at the end of Matthew 11. Let me read them a minute. Come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
come unto me. And that coming unto me consists of this. You take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke upon you. And learn of me. For I am meek and lowly of heart. And you shall find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You're under the yoke of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now what's neat about the way Jesus expresses that here in Matthew 11 is this way, is this thought. God in his sovereign providential control and and imparting of salvation delivers us from the yoke of Satan and he puts us into this relationship with himself. And by doing that, he gives us that yoke. Here's our calling. Here's our duty. Here's our responsibility. But Jesus tells the child of God, the elect, redeemed child, who's been hearing the message of salvation from sin and from the bondage of sin, who's delivered from the fear of going to hell and thinking that that everything that happens to him is God's judgment on him because he's a sinner. We're delivered from that. And God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, now comes to us And he says to us, take my yoke. May it be an exercise of your freed will. Your freed will. Remember Martin Luther wrote the book Bondage of the Will? And he was writing about those who were in bondage to sin. So much in bondage to sin that their will, their desires, could only want to do sin. Only able to do that. To those that are regenerated and converted, And called to that relationship. Irresistibly called. There comes this command. And this command, and that's the way we are to look at it. Take my yoke. It's an imperative. You want to know the will of your Savior? then the will of your Savior is, here's your responsibility. But this is also your activity. Because, having been freed from being only able to sin and take the yoke and keep that yoke and live out of that yoke of Satan, now, now, because we're not yet in heaven and because we still have that old man, we're constantly making a choice. Every second, am I going to live in the service of sin or am I going to live in the service of my Savior? Am I going to say this word and this sentence in the service of Satan or am I going to do it in the service of my Savior? Romans 16, I'm sorry, Romans 6. Remember, we referred to that. Verse 11, instead of reckoning, your, your, you can reckon yourselves no longer to be dead to sin, but you can reckon yourselves to be alive to God through Jesus Christ. So now don't yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness, but yield them as members of righteousness. Take my yoke. But you're not ever to think of yourself as, I can free to do whatever I want, because that's the bondage of sin. To do whatever you want. To live any way you please. That's back over there. But you have the ability now 
because God is working in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure, you have the ability not to do that and to do this, to do that which is right, to take my yoke. So real is that, that the apostle writes to Timothy, they're slaves, so they've got a yoke. They've got a physical slavery. They're property of somebody else. But they're also now under the yoke of Jesus Christ. Easy and light in comparison to that kind of a bondage. Why is it easy and light? Because it's easy to do? Absolutely not. Easy and light. Because, one, the obedience that it calls us to render to him is an obedience out of love. There it's anger. There it's frustration. There it's having to do it and I'm trapped and I can't do anything else. Here, this is the easy and light yoke of the relationship of love. This is easy and light because it bears the promise of everlasting life. There's the fruit. That yoke is to place ourselves into the burden of death and eternal death. This is life. Light and easy. Thirdly, because this yoke is a yoke that gives rest to the soul. It lifts the burden. It may be physically wearing. It may be hard. But inside, there's a peace. And that peace arises from the assured certain knowledge of that relationship. The one who holds the reins, the one who put the yoke on me, is not my enemy. That's my Savior. And it's easy and light forth because this is the way that I want to express my gratitude to him for what he's done for me. Have to? Well, if we take that attitude, we're back in bondage. I get to serve him. It is my pleasure to be in his service. I want that yoke of serving my Savior. That's the identity of those who are now Christians, even though they're still slaves. And he says to them, your calling as a slave is to account, reckon, consider, your master. The word master is five times translated master and five times translated Lord. And in the Greek, if you took that each Greek letter and you'd put it in English, it's English equivalent, then you'd come up with the word despot. Well, a despot is a name that we give to those tyrants. Well, that's the word. Count your despot master worthy has the value of honor, all honor, highest regard, and greatest respect. Esteem your Employer, esteem your owner 
as worthy of honor. An attitude that arises out of your understanding of Him. Now he shows what he means by rendering, count them worthy of all honor, when he adds in the end of verse 1 that the name of God, the revelation of God, and his doctrine, his teachings, be not blasphemed. Usually when we're in employment, the, the focus that we have is what's my conditions and what is my employer doing to improve my conditions? And if it's unreasonable or if it's reasonable, if, it's, if, if he makes some of the stupidest decisions and sets out the craziest rules, we're free to talk about it. Mutter about it. Complain about it. Oh, we're against labor unions. We will never join labor unions. But somehow or other, we have the freedom to throw them in the gutter. Because in our judgment, the kind of business and the kind of company that he's running is so Stupid. The apostle, inspired by the Holy Spirit, comes to these slaves and lets them know this. Instead of, instead of having your focus and perspective on my judgment of what the employer and the master is doing and setting out. Yes, you don't have to forget that relationship, but, but instead of making that your sole huge focus, back away from it. Set it down and then look up. And, and don't forget the master, the employer, but instead look at, look at, you and the other master. Look at God and His relationship to you. Deal with the same issues, but backed up. And now see, see what God has to say and realize that you are blaspheming Him. You're bringing dishonor to Him. If you do anything less than counting that master, regardless of what kind of a job he's doing in his, as an employee, employer, regardless of what kind of job he's doing, you bring blasphemy to him when you don't give all honor to that employer. You've been yoked. You've been stamped with the name of Jesus. The wicked can't see this, but you can. Because you have been given a relationship with God and that knowledge that you have that God has given to you is this. God is all authority. And God sets in authority over us those whom He will. Starting with parents. Starting then with elders and deacons in the church. And then governments and employers. Those are God's authority. And the same fifth commandment applies to every one of those four categories of divine authority. And because you are able to see that that's God's authority when you do anything less than render all honor to that, to that master or employer, 
then you're showing you don't, you, you, you forgot all about what God gave you to know about his authority. See, one more time, we don't believe that there's sacred work ministers and secular work. We believe that all work is sacred because all work is in the service of God. A mother, a teacher, a school, a student in school, we're all doing sacred work. We're all serving God. Be aware that when you're criticizing that teacher or that school board or those employers, be aware that we're taking the revelation of God and throwing it in the dirt. The motive for honoring and rendering all honor is because anything less occasions blasphemy of God and of the truth. Anything less than all honor makes us look like and live like unbelievers who have not that knowledge. So the emphasis, again, by saying we are under the yoke, is that which we saw from Ephesians 6, verse 5 last week, and you have the same thing in Colossians 3, verse 22. We are under two masters. Servants, obey in all things your masters. According to the flesh. You have a master according to the spirit. And you have a master according to the flesh. Now. Notice. He, he doesn't make any distinction. Between these masters. These despots. These lords. These employers. It doesn't make any difference. Whether they're kind or they're unkind. Whether they're. Doing their work. And their calling to God honorably. Or dishonorably. We're not to stand as their judges. We are to live in the awareness that God is our judge. He adds something here in Ephesians in 1 Timothy 6 verse 2. And he says, There are some of you that have been converted under the preaching of the gospel... And some of you probably were converted because your master was converted. And he is teaching you about the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as Lydia and the Philippian jailer, not only were they baptized, but all in their house... So all the slaves that they had in their homes were baptized because they were going to be teaching their children and their slaves this same truth. Just as all of Abraham's slaves, male slaves, were circumcised. Now, you have a believing master. It may be that according to your human nature, you may start to think, I am freed from this command. Well, maybe not totally freed, but if my master is a believing master, then he should free me and let me go. And not keep me any longer as a slave. The perspective of God's word as demonstrated 
in the letter to Philemon. A letter that Paul told Philemon's slave to take back to his master because he had run away from his master. Now converted, Paul says, okay, you take this letter, but you have to go back to your master Philemon. And I'll advise him how to handle you. But if you have a, as a slave, the exceptional privilege of having a master or an employer that's a Christian, then that lays upon you the responsibility to render to him exceptional service. Instead of thinking, he ought to free me, I don't have to render as good a service to him. No, the fact that you have a believing Master, don't despise them because they're brethren and think, well, he should be letting me go or taking it easier on me. No. You owe to them exceptional service because those Christian masters are now, to use the words of 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 Paul to Timothy, They are believing, faithful, and they are beloved, and they are partakers of the same benefits. Serve Christian masters better in gratitude because they employ you with gentleness and consideration. The apostle speaks the same way when he says to them, In Titus, be obedient to your own masters and even be eager to please them. Be eager to please them. That's Titus 2 verse 9. To please them well means literally eager to please them in all things. Then he speaks to the tongue. Everything, every student, just like every child, so every employee has to hear this over and over and over. Not answering again. Not back-talking. Not smart-mouthing. Not purloining, stealing materials. But instead... Showing all good fidelity, faithfulness, trustworthiness. Conduct yourself in such a way that your employer will trust you. And the reason, again, is because, he says it here in Titus 2, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. The reason we are to conduct ourselves that way in obedience is because we are wearing the teachings of God our Savior. And over against speaking about our faith, realize that we can live our faith. And in living our faith, we will be giving some of the best witness of God's relationship to us and what it means to be a reformed believer. We will witness. That's true not only by giving honor, that's true not only by obeying, but that is especially true when it comes to forbearing an employer or a master who is nasty, forward, to use the words of Peter. We are not free to disobey unless they command us to do that which is contrary to God's law. But we are not free ever to complain or grumble and not submit. 
we are to submit to every rule for the Lord's sake. And while it may be hard to our flesh when we see it as that which our Lord in heaven is giving to us, this is, this is what my Lord in heaven wants me to bear and to carry, then it becomes light and easy because it's an opportunity for me to glorify my Father in heaven. And this is an opportunity for me to reflect Christ. That makes it, it may be hard at the flesh, but an easy and light one. In 1 Peter, he says, what about having to deal with an a master or an employer who is just evil, treats you horribly. Sometimes they were slaves and they couldn't, they couldn't change jobs. They couldn't say, I'm going to go somewhere else. They were stuck in the providence of God in that position. And they're called by, by God through 1 Peter 2 to conduct themselves by remaining, for God's sake, submissive. That which they had to keep in mind was this. It's worded this way in 1 Peter 2.19. Conscience toward God. Conscience is literally to know with. When we know with God, then we know with God what's right, and we know with God what's wrong. When we know with God, then we say, God put me here. This is God's will for me to be here. And God wants me to bear under, whether it be this cancer, this chemo, or this nasty master. God has given me this. Conscience toward God says, God is with me here too. I'm going to know with God these circumstances. And knowing with God these circumstances, I can go to Him constantly for mercy and for grace to bear the burdens He's given to me. And again, whether it's a horrible employer or a teacher we don't like because they don't like us. Or whether it's cancer. Conscience toward God makes us aware that in this position placed here by God, I am going to be submissive and endure it, bear it, have patience through it. That's the key word, to endure and to be patient. I will hang on to the knowledge that His grace and His love for me and the forgiveness of my sins. And the declaration that I am righteous before Him. Those truths are far more important. And far greater. And nothing and no one can take them from me. And though worms may destroy this body. Though I might die. Though I might be beaten. There's a hope. that they can't take. And there's a quietness and a peace within that no man can rob from me. Endure with patience wrongs that are done to us. Because we know with God. Peter adds... That's grace. That is grace. 
God's powerful, undeserved favor to you that enables you to bear that yoke. Then he adds, not only is that grace, but he says, even here unto were you called. This is not a mistake. This is something to which you are divinely called. And, and on top of that, this is something that you are to do as an imitator of the Lord Jesus Christ. As an imitator of Jesus. Jesus not only did that which was good. In fact, all he did was good. But even though all he did was good, you know what he got for it? He was reviled. He was beaten. He was shamed. He was killed. But Jesus, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he didn't threaten. But with Jesus, we are to commit to him who judges righteously. And say, God will judge them, and God is going to judge me. He's going to judge me. He's going to judge me for my attitude. He is going to judge me for how I grumble and complain. He's going to judge me for not treating this as an opportunity to imitate Jesus and glorify him. This is my calling. God-given calling. Our text ends with the inspired words to Timothy. These things teach and exhort. And the tense of the verbs are these things keep on teaching and keep on exhorting. Instruct their minds, teach. Exhort their wills so that with what they know and now with a regenerated, pliable will, they will know and want to do that which is right. Now here's an amazing thing. Paul says that to preacher, evangelist Timothy. Why do we preach this? Because the only way to affect radically a change in our ethics, our way of living, is by preaching the gospel the good news that you are delivered from the bondage of sin and you are now a slave of Jesus Christ. Privileged. To be in his army is to be in his service. We're going to serve him forever. That's what heaven really is. Heaven is not free to do what we want. Heaven is freed from all of the things that keep me from serving, serving Him to my full capacity. So He says, now start serving now. Whether it be in the catechism room, whether it be in your attitude towards your parents, whether it be towards that teacher, whether it be towards that employer, whether it be to that master. Serve your Lord Christ. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. I give rest to your soul forever. Amen. Once again, our Father, thy word comes.
to us. And it comes to us with conviction. This morning we read that it comes to reprove, but also to correct. Work thou changes in our attitudes because we realize that we have opportunities to honor thee before men and the world by the way we live, by how we conduct ourselves. And in that way, we will put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Just as godly women could without a word but by the way they lived, win their husbands to the Christian faith. So may we give that kind of a witness. For thy glory's sake, for Jesus' sake we pray, amen.